Well, maybe you've um, heard that old saying, hanging out at McDonald's doesn't make you a Big Mac. Sleeping in the garage doesn't make you a car. Right? Pulling a wagon doesn't make you a horse. Right? But the point is clear that, that coming to church or even doing church things doesn't make you a, a Christian. Right? It doesn't guarantee a relationship with God. And, and, and frankly, going to church and being committed to doing church things will become tiresome and overwhelming and unfulfilling without a relationship with God. And, and so clearly, the hope that God is offering to us is not just another weekly commitment, but it's a relationship with him. The hope that Jesus offers to us is a renewed relationship with God, not just another seat in the house of God. And, and in many ways, in, in some strange ways, that's what the book of Zechariah is about. Zechariah is a prophet in the Old Testament who's writing to the Jewish people after they have returned from exile in Babylon. And, and they're back in the land of, of Israel, but things are hard. And they're, and they're growing discontent. And Zechariah's main point to them is that there is a better hope on the way. Hope is on the way. Their hope is not simply in a place, but in the God who promised to bring them to that place and the God who promised to meet them in that place, the God who promised salvation from their enemies, the God who has now preserved them and saved them and redeemed them. That's their hope. So one way to put it is that hope is being in the family, not just in the house. Especially in our passage today, this is what we're going to see Zechariah doing. This is what really God's doing through Zechariah the prophet. He's calling people back to himself. Calling them, and, and perhaps we might say calling us to repentance. And so we're going to look at the opening section of the book of Zechariah in, in just a moment. That's what we're doing now. We're starting this new series in the book of Zechariah called Hope is on the Way. And we'll be in the book of Zechariah for several weeks looking at this. But I want to make sure as we begin this series that we understand where we are in the, the story of Scripture, in the biblical story. And so just to make it a little bit easier to see what, um, what God is doing here, let me give you a framework for thinking about the biblical story that I think will be helpful for us. The, the pervasive promise of God throughout Scripture is these three things— People, place, and presence. Okay, that's God's promise, is that he's saving a people for himself. So he's going to make them a people, and then he's going to give to that people a place of blessing. And in that place, his presence will dwell with them. People, place, and presence. And so if we go all the way back to the book of Genesis, that's what we find, right? Genesis 1, we find the creation of the world. And while there's a lot of things that we could talk about around the creation of the world, perhaps the most important thing that we should note is that God has created humanity in his own image in that place, created us to have relationship with him. He created a people and then he gave them a place, we call that place the Garden of Eden, and in that place his presence dwelt with them. But then we find that these humans, instead of trusting God's goodness, decided to pursue themselves. They sinned and threw themselves and truly the whole of creation into disarray. Right? And, and what happens? They're cast out of the place and they're cast out of the presence of God. But God persists in his love for his people. In his grace, he sets in motion this plan of redemption that's going to culminate in the, in the coming of Christ. It's going to culminate in Jesus' death and resurrection. It's going to be fully realized when Christ comes again and he takes us all to be with him. When he gathers his people and he takes us to his place, we call that heaven or the new heavens and the new earth. And then Revelation 21 tells us that God will dwell with them and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. People, place, presence. This is the promise of God in Scripture. 
but the book of Revelation is a long ways off. So let's go back to Genesis for just a moment. God gathers up this guy named Abraham in the book of Genesis, and he makes a covenant with them. Abraham's going to be known as the father of the people of Israel, right? God's people of the, of the Old Testament. So let me just read for you the promise that God makes to Abraham. It's in Genesis 17. Here's what God says to him. He says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So you see God's desire that they will be his people and they will have a, a place of blessing and he will be with them. His presence will be with them. God is a God of relationship. And, and the promise is that they're going to have that relationship, that we're going to have that relationship with him forever. He will be their God and they will be his people. Right? God's desiring. God wants relationship with us, people, place, presence. Well, let's just fast forward through a couple of hundred years. Here's what happens. Abraham has a son named Isaac, and Isaac has a son named Jacob. And then Jacob and God get into this fight one night, and God changes his name to Israel, which means wrestles with God. And Israel has 12 sons. That's why we refer to the 12 tribes of Israel. They come from the 12 sons of Israel. One of those sons is a guy named Joseph. And Joseph is sold by his brothers into slavery in Egypt, but turns out, because God turns evil things into good all the time, turns out God's using him and his slavery to save an entire region from this catastrophic famine. And included in that salvation, his own family, the people of Israel. And that's how the family of Israel get reunited with one another in Egypt. And things go pretty good there for a while, but then a new Pharaoh pops up. He doesn't know who Joseph is. He doesn't like the Jewish people, and he puts them all into slavery. And the people eventually begin to cry out to God from the midst of their slavery, asking that God would deliver them, right? They're the children of Abraham. They have a promise from God that they're going to have a place to be. But instead, they're in somebody else's land, and they're in slavery. And so they cry out to God, and God hears them, and he raises up this guy named Moses to rescue them, to lead them out, and this is what God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering, and I have come to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So look, just look at what God is saying again. God says, I know that they're my people. I know them. I heard them. I listen to their voice. They are my people, and I have a place for them, a place that is flowing with every blessing. Not just milk, but milk and honey. It is flowing with every blessing. And so here I come, bringing my presence to bring my people into the place that I've prepared for them. And that's what they do, right? They leave Egypt in, in spectacular fashion. But then as they get out into the wilderness, they begin to mistrust God. They don't want to follow his presence anymore. And so they wander around in the desert for 40 years. But God's presence never leaves them. And finally, under the leadership of Joshua, they get the land that was promised to them. The people are in the place, but almost as soon as they get there, they forget the best part of the promise. They forget about God's presence. So the people are in the place, but they're not experiencing the presence of the Lord. 
and they start worshiping other gods. And the cycle begins, a cycle that we see in our own hearts all of the time. They, they turn from God. They, they abandon the protection of God. And because they've moved outside of his protection, they end up being captured. They end up being taken. If you, and if you really look at it, here's what happens. They're captured by the very gods that they have given themselves over to. The very gods that they worship. They start worshiping the gods of the Moabites, and guess what happens? The Moabites come in and conquer them. They worship the gods of the Philistines, and the Philistines come in and conquer them. Whatever it is that they've given themselves over to just captures them and oppresses them. Doesn't that sound like our lives? It just captures us. When you give part of your heart to the, to the pursuit of money, don't be surprised when you're captured by greed. When you give a, a little part of your heart to seeking approval, don't be surprised when you're captured by pride and selfishness. When you give just a little bit of your heart, a little bit of your mind to dwelling on sexual thoughts, don't be surprised when you're captured by pornography and sexual immorality. Just give a little bit of your heart to unforgiveness and then don't be surprised when you're captured by anger and hatred and bitterness. And the list just goes on and on. We give just a little bit of ourselves over. We step outside of the protection of God and the very things we're worshiping take us and they capture us and they hold us captive in oppression. But these are God's people and they're in the place of blessing, but they keep turning to other gods. They keep worshiping other things. They get captured and eventually they'll cry out for deliverance. And when they do, God, in his mercy, over and over and over again, he saves them. And he brings them back home. He brings them back to himself. And one of the signs in the Old Testament of the presence of God being with his people is the temple. And, and before the, the temple was, was built, they had basically a, a mobile temple that they called the tabernacle. And when the tabernacle was originally built in Exodus chapter 40, as soon as they built it, they finished it. Here's what we're told. We're told that the presence of God flooded the tabernacle with so much space that Moses couldn't even go in because the Spirit of the Lord had filled it. The same thing happens when they finish the temple in 1 Kings 8. The Spirit of God floods the place so much so that the priests could no longer do their priestly duties in the place because God's presence was dwelling with his people, just as he had promised them. But, but eventually, right, all of this sort of repeated cycle of turning away from God gets to be too much. God had tried repeatedly to warn them. God had saved them time and time again, brought them back over and over again. He warned them through the prophets over and over again. And what did they do? They just killed the prophets. And so God allows this guy named Nebuchadnezzar to carry off the people into captivity in Babylon. But, but even in this, God gives a promise. They're carried off into captivity. They're no longer in the place. But God gives a promise through the prophet Jeremiah that this is going to last for 70 years. And after 70 years, he's going to bring them back to the place that he had promised and they will dwell in his presence again. Well, those 70 years are just about up when we come to the book of Zechariah. And God has been faithfully keeping his promises once again. He's brought this people back from exile. The people are back in the place. But they aren't yet experiencing the presence of God. The temple, which had been torn down when Nebuchadnezzar came in, they started to build it back, but then they stopped. Things got hard other people began to oppose them. Their neighbors said, don't do that here. We don't want that here. Don't go away. And so they had stopped building the temple. God's presence is not there. 
and they haven't fully repented of their idolatry. And so God sends the prophet Zechariah to spur them on, to call them to full and final repentance, to remind them of the promises of God, to remind them of their true hope, that hope is on the way and that it is found in the presence of God. And so we're going to spend the next few weeks thinking about the book of Zechariah. Today, we want to look at just the first six verses. And so if you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead and turn to Zechariah chapter 1. If you picked up one of these Bibles on your way in, you'll find it on page 880. And just a reminder, as always, these Bibles here, they're here for you. If you don't have a Bible of your own, please take one of these. We want you to have a copy of God's Word. Let me read for us the first six verses, Zechariah 1, verses 1 to 6. It says this. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Iddo, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore, say to them, thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets cried out, thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds, but they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants to prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they repented and said, As the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so has he dealt with us. The call of God through the prophet Zechariah is that they would return. Return to The Lord. The word that we might more often use is the word repent, and it includes two aspects, and they're both here in our passage. One is turning from evil, and the other is turning by faith towards God. And the people might might reply, right? But we're already here. We've already returned to the land. We're here in Jerusalem. Right? But, but being a McDonald's doesn't make you a Big Mac, right? The promise of God, the hope of God is not just that we would be in the place, but that we would be experiencing the presence of the Lord. People, place, presence. That's the greatest part of the promise is that his presence will be with us, which is why Zechariah is emphasizing this here. Right? They aren't being asked to return to Jerusalem. They're already there. They're being asked to return to the Lord. And, and we might consider the same sort of question for ourselves. Because if, if we're saying, well, yeah, but I already, I already prayed that prayer. I already got baptized. I clearly already come to church. I'm here today, right? I'm here. Yes, but I want to consider that perhaps God's not just calling us to come into a building or to do churchy things. God's calling us to return to his presence, to return to relationship with him, to cling more tightly to that hope, that hope that is found in the presence of God. And so if you're, if you're feeling hopeless today, here's, here's what Zacharias says, God's calling If you're feeling distant from the Lord, I can promise you this. God didn't move. And he wants you back just as much as you want him back. Now, I don't know everything that's going on in in everybody's life, but but I feel like there are some of us who are here who have wandered. And I don't mean like wandered from your salvation. I don't even know exactly what that means. What I mean is that we've wandered from the presence of God. And we've, we've wandered from the protection of God. And I know that sometimes when we, when we wander, we begin to feel like we don't know how to get back. Maybe we feel like God doesn't want us back. But our passage today assures us that God definitely does. 
And I hope that in this little bit of time that we have, that we'll just consider three reasons to return to the presence of God. The first is simply this, return because God is calling. Look at verse 3. Therefore say to them, thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Three times in this little bitty verse, the Lord of hosts is identified as the one who is calling. He is calling out to his people, return to me. And and just notice for, for context, Um, where this call comes in our passage, right? Zechariah has just reminded them of the anger of the Lord against their ancestors. And the implication might be that God is angry with us as well. He's angry with all who would worship or, or abandon him for other idols and for false gods. I don't know. When somebody's angry with me, the last thing that I want to do is go be with them. It's not what I want. I want to stay away. Maybe eventually they'll stop being angry with me. I don't want to go and be with them. And this is what Zechariah, this is what he's speaking to. He's speaking to the person who knows that God is angry with them and because of that doesn't want to return to him. And he's saying, yeah, but God is calling you. God is calling. He's reaching out. He isn't angry in a I never want to see you again sort of way. He's angry in a I hate how your sin destroys our relationship sort of way. God is angry with our sin, but he longs. He longs to relent. He longs to be angry no longer. He longs for you to return so it's important perhaps to understand how God's not angry like we get angry. God's not petty. God's not just waiting for an opportunity to be angry. In fact, what scripture says is that he's slow to anger. His anger is all righteous anger, which is to say he has every right to have it. Because our our actions, our sinful actions are a direct affront to him and his love. And yet again, the Bible tells us that God will not remain angry forever because his desire is that all would repent, that all would turn to him, that none would perish. His desire is for a relationship with his people. And so he's calling out, asking that we would return to him. And he's calling and calling and calling because our God is a God of pursuit. He's always pursuing his people. We we can just talk about Jesus. We hear the way Jesus talks in the New Testament. He talks about God as the the shepherd who goes looking for the lost sheep, right? He's, He's the woman who sweeps the whole house looking for the lost coin. He's the father who faithfully watches for his son, just hoping that he might return, that their relationship might be restored. I mean, just read that story. There's all sorts of reasons why that father should be angry at his son. And yet he's watching and waiting, called ready to receive him, ready to embrace him, ready to welcome him, not just back into the house, but back into the family. Come home, he says. And so God is calling us back into his presence because hope is found in the presence of God. But, but we shouldn't just return because God is calling, but also because he's warning us. And that's really what's, what's happening here. But the exile of God's people was heartbreaking to God. To see his people taken captive off in, in Babylon, to see the temple where he once met with and enjoyed time with his people, to see it torn to the ground, that was heartbreaking. And God does not want that to happen again. And so he comes to them warning them, warning us to return, to return to his safe protection. When I was a kid, we, we used to frequent um, Six Flags, the original Six Flags, Six Flags over Texas. There's just one ride there called Splashdown Falls. It's basically just a big boat 
that you go up and then you come down this big chute into this big pool of water. And when you hit the water, this just tidal wave goes up. And after you got off the ride, you could go and you could stand on this bridge. And when you stood on the bridge, when the, when the, when the boat hit the water, it would just splash you on the bridge. So there were signs everywhere on the bridge saying, if you stand on this bridge, you're going to get wet. Warning, if you don't want to get wet, don't stand on the bridge. This is the splash zone, right? And that's exactly right. If you stood on the bridge, you would get drenched. The next tidal wave was coming, and nobody who was standing on the bridge would be spared, right? So sure enough, the next boat would come, and everybody on the bridge would take a bath. Now, who's to blame for that? Is it the boat's fault for not seeing the people on the bridge and stopping before it hit the water? Is it the pilot of the boat's fault? No, no. They got wet because regardless of the warnings, they stood on the bridge. In the same way, when we refuse to listen to the warnings of God, we can't blame him for the consequences that we face. Now, you can stand on the bridge for some time before the next tidal wave comes, and you can live in rebellion against God for some time before you face those consequences. But you cannot blame him when the consequences come because he is warning you, get off the bridge. Return to me. Come back into my protection. The only real hope that we will find is in the presence of God. So he says, return to me, return to my protection, return to my love. Don't let what happened to your fathers happen to you. Return to me. So we should return to God because he's calling us and because he's warning us, but also because his promises are as true as his warnings. I think some of us, when we think about the salvation offered in Christ, all we think of is what it gets us out of. And we don't think about what it gets us into. Right? When the, when the people of Israel were in slavery in Egypt and God promised them that deliverance through Moses, he didn't just promise to bring them out of slavery. He promised to bring them in to a land that was flowing with milk and honey. Right? Yes, there, there is grave danger to those who stay in their sin, but there is amazing blessings for those who return to the Lord. And that's why in our passage right here, Zechariah reminds the people that if they will return to the Lord, he will return to them. Which actually, what I, I think it probably better reads like this. If you will return to the Lord, you'll find out that he was always there. That he never left. When you return to the Lord, the experience will be one of him returning to you, but the reality will be he never moved. Return to them and he will meet with them and he will dwell with them and he will be with them. In the same way, the promise of God to those who repent today is not just forgiveness of our sins or freedom from our bondage or victory over our enemies, but Jesus promises that when we return to him, he will give us eternal life, abundant life. He says this, he says that we're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit that is going to begin to produce in us things like love and joy and peace and patience and, and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those aren't things that Galatians tells us to work on. Those are things that Galatians says are the overflowing fruit of a life that is surrendered to the Holy Spirit's movement in my life. When I return to God, those things just start happening. And who doesn't want those sorts of things? Who doesn't want peace? Right? Especially in the midst of everything seems so chaotic. Who doesn't want joy? Who doesn't want joy when everything around us seems so hard? Who doesn't want to be patient? You know, if you're more patient, you don't have to feel gross in the way that impatience makes you feel. So wouldn't you want to be more patient? Wouldn't you want to be more self-controlled? 
If you're self-controlled, you don't feel gross the way that like being out of control makes you feel. These are God's promises to those who return to him. He says, I'm not just going to take you out of that. I'm not just going to deliver you from the kingdom of darkness, but I'm going to transfer you to the kingdom of my beloved son. Fill you with the Holy Spirit that's going to begin to bear fruit in your life. The promises of God to those who walk with them. And he promises us that he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He'll be with us to the very end of the age. And so friend, return to God. Because his promises are as true as his warnings. His promises are true and they are glorious. And here's the thing, no matter how far you've run, I can promise you that God is calling and he's willing and ready to receive you back. And I can promise you that there is no hope outside of the presence of God. But in him, all of our hopes are realized. And so if in in any way, if you feel distant from God today, I pray that you will return to the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your promises. You promise that that when we return to you, that you will be found. That when we seek after you, you will be found. Lord, we thank you that, that you promise relationship with us. And so we pray that you would help us to evaluate our lives. And even now as we prepare to take communion, that we would evaluate our lives and see, is there any way in my life that I've run from the Lord? Is there any way in my life that I am distant from the Lord? And we pray that, Lord, today, by the power of your Spirit, that today we would return to you. In Christ's name. Amen.